Hello guys, welcome back. This is Dr. Jibran Ahmed and you are watching Pathology videos with me and uh, today's topic of discussion is cell injury. So let's start without wasting any more time. Yes, so cell response to injury. So first of all, what is adaptation? Adaptation kya hota hai? Okay, adaptation is a reversible process. Okay, first you should think about it. It is a reversible process. It is defined as a response to any change in a physiological state and some pathological stimuli as a result of which a new altered yet a steady state is achieved allowing the cells to function and to survive. Okay, so let us look at this flowchart for a better understanding. So here we can see the normal cells. Can you see? Now, whenever we give any kind of a stress, okay, the cell goes for something called as adaptation. Okay, now if the cells are unable to adapt, okay, it leads to a condition called as cell injury. Okay, now there is another way that the cell can be injured. If the stimulus is <clears throat> is injurious is highly injurious so if there is a severe injurious stimuli the normal cell can directly go to cell injury without any kind of adaptation okay and uh, uh, from this cell injury state uh, 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 the cell can go to two pathways if the injurious stimulus is mild and transient then it is reversible and the cell goes back to its normal state. If the injurious stimulus is severe and progressive, the cell goes towards irreversible cell injury. And irreversible cell injury is characterized by necrosis and apoptosis. So I repeat again, a normal cell, uh, whenever it will come under any kind of stress, it goes towards adaptation. Okay, if those cells are unable to adapt, they go to something called as cell injury. Now, there is another pathway where the cell can directly land in cell injury without going towards adaptation. That means whenever there is a severe injurious stimulus, the normal cell will directly go to cell injury without going to adaptation. Now, the cell injury, uh, 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 the cell can go in two main pathways. If the injurious stimulus is mild and transient, the cell goes back to its normal state. Whereas, if the injurious stimulus is severe and progressive, the cell will land an irreversible cell injury and uh, uh, the forms of irreversible cell injury are necrosis and apoptosis. And once again, I just want to say adaptation is a reversible process and is defined as a response to any change in physiological state and some pathological stimuli as a result of which a new altered yet a steady state is achieved allowing the cells to function and survive. Now, let us look at the different kinds of nature of injurious stimulus. So, let us see. Number one, A, whenever there is an altered physiological stimulus, okay, altered physiological stimulus, jab bhi hoga, the cell will go to cell adaptation. Again, we have uh, mentioned this thing that cell adaptations are reversible changes. Cell adaptation are reversible changes. So, let us look at this physiological stimulus that leads to reversible adaptation. If we increase the stimulus, for example, growth factors, hormones, or increased workload, it will lead to hypertrophy or hyperplasia. If we reduce the stimulus, it can lead to atrophy. And if we cause chronic irritation, it can lead to metaplasia. All of these terms, these four terms, hyperplasia, hypertrophy, atrophy, and metaplasia are kinds of cell adaptation, and they are reversible changes. Okay, now if we are giving uh, B, okay, if you're giving any kind of injury stimulus, for example, hypoxia, infections, or chemicals, if they are acute and transient, as we have discussed, it will lead to reversible cell injury in the form of cell swelling and fatty change. But if it is severe and progressive, it will lead to irreversible injury, as we have already discussed, necrosis and apoptosis. Now, C. Metabolic alteration. So, any kind of chronic injury can lead to intracellular accumulations and calcifications. And D, cumulative sublethal injury over a long period of time that will lead to a process that is unavoidable and is called as cellular aging. So, there are four different kinds of injury stimulus. One is your altered physiological stimuli. One is your injurious stimuli in the form of hypoxia, infections, chemicals. One is your metabolic alterations and one is your cumulative sublethal injury over long time. Now, one important MCQ over here is uh, 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 what is the dye which dyes 
the myocardium and helps us to differentiate dead myocardium from a viable myocardium. So here the answer is triphenyl tetrazoleum chloride and it is only staining the viable myocardium magenta colored. Now adaptations, let us uh, uh, take adaptations as we have seen that there are four main kind of adaptations. Number one is hypertrophy. Hypertrophy ka matlab kya hai? Hypertrophy means there is only an increase in the cell size. Okay, and it is occurring in those cells which do not divide. Okay, I repeat, hypertrophy ka matlab hota hai just increase in cell size and it will occur in those cells which do not divide. Again, hypertrophy can be of two main types. Okay, it can be physiological and it can be pathological. So, physiological hypertrophy occurs in the muscles in the uterus. So, in the muscles kab hota hai? When we are going for bodybuilding, then our muscles go for hypertrophy. Uterus, yes, uterus during pregnancy undergoes hypertrophy as well as hyperplasia. <coughs> now, pathological kab hota hai? Example, pathological hypertrophy occurs in the heart. When does it occur? Example, when we have hypertension. Individuals who are hypertensive over a long period of time develops hypertrophy of the heart. And what is the basic mechanism of Hypertrophy, increased production of cellular proteins. Now, second kind of adaptation is hyperplasia. Hyperplasia ka matlab kya hai? Increase in cell number. Whenever the cell number increases, it is called as hyperplasia. So, there is again physiological hyperplasia and pathological hyperplasia. Let us look at the examples of physiological hyperplasia. For example, regeneration of the liver. As we will recall, liver is, has, uh, an, uh, has an immense capacity of regeneration. Okay, Even if uh, uh, one-tenth capacity of the liver is remaining, it will regenerate to its original size. Now, breast during puberty and during pregnancy and marrow after hemolysis or acute bleed. These are examples of physiological hyperplasia. Now, what are the examples of pathological hyperplasia? Examples very common is cancer. Okay, very common is cancer. Okay, cancer divides and redivides and goes on dividing without any uh, regulation from the body's part. It acts on its own. Okay, then there is benign prostatic hypertrophy known as BPH. Again, it is an example of pathological hyperplasia. Then you have endometrial hyperplasia. Endometrial hyperplasia uh, again is uh, comes under pathological hyperplasia and lastly is skin wart. So we are having three examples of physiological hyperplasia and four examples of pathological hyperplasia. And what are the mechanisms of hyperplasia? Number one, there are two mechanisms. Mechanism one is because of increased new cell formation from tissue stem cell. So from the tissue stem cells, new cell, uh, cells are being formed. And secondly, we are having growth factor induced proliferation of mature cells. So either stem cells say zada cells ban rahe, or dusra cheez kya ki growth factor induced proliferation of mature cells only. Okay, so two mechanisms of hyperplasia. Let us look at this beautiful image. Now, what is this? This is a normal myocardium. As you look at this part, this part is the left ventricle, which is normally thicker as compared to the right ventricle. Okay, this is your left ventricle. And this is your right ventricle. And left ventricle normally is thicker than the right ventricle. Look at this uh, image. This image is showing hypertrophy. Look at how the left ventricle has hypertrophy. Look at the size and look at the lumen. The lumen has been reduced. And left uh, ventricle has hypertrophied so much. And look over here at the right ventricle. Okay, the right ventricle is normal. But the left ventricle shows hypertrophy. And look over here. This is again the myocardium which is showing a huge area of necrosis, which is myocardial cell death. Okay, so there are three images I showed you. Number one is the normal myocardium. Number two is the hypertrophic myocardium. And number three is myocardium showing cell death. Now, let us see. We gave an example of the uterus as an example of physiological hypertrophy. See, there is hypertrophy of the uterus during pregnancy. The gross appearance of a normal uterus see can you see a, a normal uterus and if you see a gravid uterus which is removed for postpartum bleeding okay this is the gravid uterus look at this this is the gravid uterus so physiological hypertrophy of the uterus during pregnancy is a gross appearance of a normal uterus on the right side as i showed you which is small and a gravid uterus which is removed for postpartum bleeding 
Now, this is the microscopic examination that shows, if you look at the first diagram, there are the, uh, uh, we can see small spindle-shaped uterine smooth muscle cells from a normal uterus and you compare it, you compare it with the image on the right side, these same cells have become large plump from the gravid uterus at the same magnification. Can you see the difference between these two images? So, the image on the right hand side has undergone hypertrophy and they are bigger as compared to the image on the left hand side. Both of them have been taken on the same magnification. Coming to the third kind of adaptation, so we have read about hypertrophy, we have read about hyperplasia, now we come to atrophy. Atrophy ka matab kya hai ki both the cell size as well as the cell number is reducing. That is the meaning of atrophy. Okay, decreased cell size and decreased cell number. Again, it can be physiological and it can be pathological. Physiological kab hota hai? Physiological atrophy of example, hamara thyroclossal cyst. Second example ho jayega, umbilical cord or notochord after childbirth. And the uterus after childbirth. Okay, these are three main examples of physiological atrophy. Let us look at the example of pathological atrophy. Atrophy of disuse means agar if you are not using a, a particular body part, example after paralysis, there will be atrophy of disuse. Okay, then there is denervation atrophy. Denervation atrophy occurs after any damage to the nerve supplying a particular muscle. Okay, if that nerve is damaged, that muscle won't be used and because of that, there will be atrophy and that is called as denervation atrophy. There is something called as senile atrophy. In old age, there is aging. Okay, old age, there is aging and there is atrophy. There is senile atrophy. Again, don't ask me anything about this because all of you will think that that uh, uh, <coughs> senile atrophy will be a kind of physiological atrophy. But in Robbins, it is given it is a senile atrophy. Okay, fourth is pressure atrophy. Whenever, so example in case of a pneumothorax, okay, whenever there is excess amount of air in the pleural space that causes pressure over the lungs and causes it to atrophy. So that is an example of pressure atrophy. Decreased hormonal stimulation, yes, post-menopausally, if you look at hormonal stimulation is reduced because of that there is atrophy of all the secondary sexual organs in case of females. Even nutrition, if there is protein energy malnutrition or decreased nutrition, it leads to cachexia, it leads to atrophy of the body parts. So, there are three examples for physiological atrophy and there are six examples for pathological atrophy. Let us look at the mechanisms of atrophy. First mechanism is there is reduced protein synthesis plus increased protein degradation. Second example being autophagy and third example being residual bodies. Okay, so these, whenever there is atrophy, Okay, atrophy occurs in the form of residual bodies which are nothing but the lipofuscin granules and these form an example of brown atrophy of the heart. Okay, so brown atrophy of the heart is comprised of lipofuscin granules which are nothing but the residual bodies after atrophy. The fourth very important example is metaplasia. Now, I would like to read the definition of metaplasia and would love to explain the meaning of it. Metaplasia means what? It means conversion of one cell type to another, but the parent tissue remaining the same. So, there is a big catch in the understanding of the definition of metaplasia. So, it is again, I say, it is the conversion of one cell type to another, but the parent tissue remaining the same. For example, now I will give you an example. Now, our body is comprised of three types of tissues. We are having epithelial tissue, we are having mesenchymal tissue and we are having neural tissue. So, these three kinds of tissue are forming the parent tissue. Okay, epithelial is one parent tissue, mesenchymal is another parent tissue, neural is another parent tissue. Under epithelial, we are having squamous, columnar or cuboidal. Okay, so under epithelial tissue, we are having squamous, columnar, and we are having cuboidal. Okay, so what my point is, what is the meaning of metaplasia? Means squamous changing to columnar or columnar changing to squamous or squamous changing to cuboidal or cuboidal changing to columnar. Anything in between. But epithelial will never change to mesenchymal or mesenchymal is not changing to epithelial. Okay, that doesn't mean metaplasia. So, metaplasia means conversion of one cell type, example squamous, to another cell type, example columnar, but both of them are epithelial tissue. So, the parent tissue remains the same. Now, look at this example. 
this is a, a normal brain of a young adult in A, this one. Okay, and B, an atrophy. Look, how does atrophy happen from age? Atrophy of the brain in an 82-year-old man with atherosclerotic cerebrovascular disease resulting in a reduced blood supply. Note that the loss of brain substance narrows the gyri. If you see, the gyri has been narrowed and widens the sulca. This is the sulcus. They have become widened. The meninges have been stripped from the right half of each specimen to reveal the surface of the brain. So just remember on the left side is a young adult. On the right side is an 82 year old man. So look, because of atherosclerotic cerebrovascular disease, how there is atrophy in comparison to a young adult. Now, this is a beautiful image showing metaplasia. Dekho, on the left hand side, I am marking, look at this part. On the left hand side, I am marking this is the part which is showing columnar epithelium. Okay, this part is showing columnar epithelium. It is a pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, which is showing a metaplastic change to. I am marking on the right side, so it is changing to squamous epithelium. So if you see over here, on the left hand side is a pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, and on the right hand side is the squamous epithelium. In a case of a bronchus. So, this is classical example of metaplasia. So, columnar epithelium is changing to squamous epithelium and both of them are, are the same parent tissue type that is epithelium. Okay, they are the same parent tissue type that is epithelium. Coming to examples of metaplasia, Number one, the most common the most common kind of metaplasia is when columnar epithelium changing to squamous epithelium. Let us look at the examples. Example in smokers, the respiratory epithelium, that is the columnar epithelium, changes to squamous epithelium. Again, whenever any kind of stone is blocking the pancreas, bile duct, salivary gland, the epithelium changes from columnar to squamous. Third, Whenever there is vitamin deficiency, again, respiratory epithelium changes to squamous epithelium. So, this is first kind of metaplasia. Second example is reverse. Squamous changing to columnar. Now, because of acidity in the stomach, uh, in the esophagus, the esophagus changes uh, its epithelium from squamous to columnar and that esophagus is called as Barrett's esophagus and that forms a risk factor for development of adenocarcinoma or adenocancer. Okay, third is connective tissue metaplasia. Connective tissue metaplasia is a kind of metaplasia which is taking place in mesenchymal tissues. One example is myositis ossificans. Matlab kya hai That in the muscles you are having bone. Okay, that is in one kind of, of mesenchymal tissue you are having another kind of mesenchymal tissue. Muscle is one kind of mesenchymal tissue and bone is another, is another, another kind of mesenchymal tissue. So you are finding bone in the muscle. So, this is the example of connective tissue <coughs> metaplasia. Now, causes of cell injury. The most common cause of cell injury is hypoxia. Okay, try to understand. The most common cause of cell injury is, hy is hypoxia, whereas the most common cause of hypoxia is ischemia. Ischemia ka matlab kya hai? Reduced blood flow. Or hypoxia ka matlab kya hai? Reduced amount of oxygen at the level of tissue. Okay, that is hypoxia. So, causes of cell injury, the most common cause is hypoxia and the most common cause of hypoxia is ischemia. What are the other causes of hypoxia? There are physical agents, for example, heat, cold, burn, radiation. The chemicals, for example, insecticides, herbicides, arsenic, mercury, cyanides. Then there are microbicidal agents, for example, uh, microbial agents, sorry, uh, bacteria, fungus, viruses. Immunological reactions in our body can cause cell injury. There are genetic derangements which can cause cell injury. And lastly, nutritional imbalances. Our nutrition will be more. It can lead to what? Obesity. If nutrition becomes less, it can lead to protein energy malnutrition or anorexia nervosa. Now look at this beautiful graph. Now, this graph divides okay, and shows a difference between reversible cell injury and irreversible cell injury. So on the x-axis we are having the duration of injury and on the y-axis we are having the effect. So if you look in reversible injury uh, uh, the graph is going down. So with time and this graph is representing cell function. Okay, The graph is going down Okay, and there is a certain point after which 
the cell, there's a certain point over here, as you can see, after which the cell goes towards irreversible cell injury. And irreversible cell injury is, has many stages. As you can see, I have uh, 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 four graphs with different names. So if you look at graph number one, the graph number one is representing the biochemical changes which has led to cell death. Okay, I repeat, they are showing the biochemical changes which has uh, 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 which has led to cell death. Graph number two shows the ultrastructural changes and such ultrastructural changes leading to cell death are seen under electron microscopy. Graph number three shows light microscopic changes. So in the microscope, we are having microscopic changes. So light microscopic changes are seen uh, in, in graph three. And the graph four, gross changes. Gross changes are those changes which are observed under naked eye. Okay, light microscopic changes are those changes which are observed under microscope. Ultrastructural changes are those changes which are observed under electron microscope. Okay, and biochemical changes are at the level of molecular level. Okay, so what I really want to say that with time, just as just time bharta hai, with the duration of injury, uh, uh, we can see that first we are having biochemical changes, then we are having ultrastructural changes, then we are having light microscopic changes and lastly we are having gross changes. Gross changes are those changes which can be seen with the naked eye. Okay. Now a very important uh, 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 chart which shows the difference between necrosis and apoptosis. So very important, I have divided necrosis and apoptosis under various headings. Agar cell size dekhenge, in necrosis the cell size is increasing whereas in apoptosis the cell size is reducing. If you look, the nucleus undergoes three phenomenon in necrosis. First, there is pycnosis that means chromatin condensation. Then there is carrier hexis that means nuclear fragmentation. And then there is karyolysis that is nuclear dissolution or disappearance. And under apoptosis, the nucleus undergoes fragmentation into nucleosome-like fragment, size fragment. Third is the cell membrane. In necrosis, the cell membrane shows disruption, whereas the cell membrane is intact in apoptosis. The cell contains leak out in necrosis, whereas there is formation of apoptotic bodies inside the cell in case of apoptosis. Inflammation is present in necrosis, whereas it is absent in apoptosis. Necrosis is always pathologic, whereas apoptosis can be pathologic or can be physiologic as well. And the main stimulus for necrosis is membrane damage. Okay, Necrosis will happen when, whenever there is membrane damage. Whereas apoptosis will happen when, whenever there is a damage to the DNA and there is misfolded proteins, it will lead to apoptosis. Now let us come to reversible changes. So whenever the cell injury is there, there are certain reversible changes which takes place first. Okay, Before irreversible injury, there is reversible changes. Let us see what are those reversible changes. One, there is generalized cell swelling. Two, there is a bleb formation. Three, there will be detachment of ribosome from endoplasmic reticulum. And four, there is clumping of the nuclear chromatin. So all of these four changes are reversible. That means if the injurious stimulus is removed, all of these four changes will revert back to normal. Okay. Now, if you look, uh, if all of these four, if the injurious stimulus continues, that means there is loss of ATP, there is a reduction in protein synthesis, and there is DNA damage. If all these three changes will continue, it will lead to irreversible cell injury in the form of necrosis and apoptosis. So, I repeat, if the injurious stimulus remains or persists, for example, the ATP keeps on reducing, protein synthesis has declined and DNA damage persists, it will lead to irreversible cell injury in the form of necrosis and apoptosis. Now, let us look at the reversible cell injury or reversible cell changes. Kya hota I have already mentioned earlier that reversible cell changes do se hota hai. One is cellular swelling. Cells jo hai swelling hoti hai cells ki. And number two is the fatty change. Okay. One is your cellular changes or cellular swelling. And another one is your fatty change. Let us see why there is cellular swelling. Cell swelling hota hai because there is a failure of these cell ion pumps. Cell swelling occurs because of failure of cell ion pumps. And the fatty change occurs because of accumulation of lipid vacuoles, that is hepatocytes and myocardium, may mainly we can see the fatty change. So fatty change occurs because of accumulation of lipid vacuoles within the cells and it is occurring in the liver and in the heart.
Now, uh, before we go into the gross features of reversible changes, I will tell you why there is a, a, a cellular swelling because of failure of cell ion pumps. Okay, try to understand. In a cell, in a cell, mein kya hota hai? that there, are, there is continuous sodium leak within the cell. Okay, there is continuous sodium leak inside the cell. So, what will happen? The concentration of sodium within the cell will increase. And as we know that sodium ions are osmotically active, it will draw water inside. Okay, so if the sodium ions continuously draw water inside, the cell will continue to swell, swell, swell and suddenly will burst. Okay, the cell will burst suddenly. So to prevent that burst, our cells have sodium potassium pump. What the sodium potassium pump does, it is an active pump. It will throw three sodium ions outside the cell and will pump two potassium ions inside the cell. And remember, for this sodium potassium pump to work, we require ATP. It is an active pump. Okay, coming to the gross changes of reversible bill cell injury, grossly, any organ which has reversible cell injury will be edematous, will show pallor, will show increased turgor and increased weight of the organ. ME ka matlab hota hai microscopic examination. Under the microscope, what we will see in reversible changes, we will see small vacuoles which are pinched off from the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and such vacuoles pinched off from the endoplasmic reticulum represents hydropic change or vacuolar degeneration. The second change that we see under the microscope is increased eosinophilic staining. Eosinophilic means pink, pink staining. Okay, eosinophilic staining. Now, what are the ultrastructural changes that we see? The cell and organelle, all of them, they show swelling, and the plasma membrane shows blebbing. Plasma membrane may blebbing hoga, but try to understand the plasma membrane remains intact in a reversible cell injury. So we have spoken about the gross changes the microscopic changes and the ultrastructural changes that are associated with reversible cell injury. Now we come to irreversible cell injury. Number one is necrosis. Now let us define necrosis. What is necrosis? So necrosis is defined as an irreversible form of cell death which is characterized by denaturation of intracellular proteins and enzymatic digestion of lethally injured cell. Let me repeat. So necrosis is defined as an irreversible form of cell death okay which is characterized by denaturation of intracellular proteins and enzymatic digestion of lethally injured cell so out of the definition there are two main components number one is there is protein denaturation and number two there is enzymatic digestion so let us see where are these enzymes coming from these enzymes are basically coming from the lysosomes the lysosomes of the dying cells Plus, they are also coming from the leukocytes. Plus, they are also coming from the leukocytes. One important MCQ at this level is the earliest thing in necrosis, answer kya hai, increase in enzyme levels as occurs in myocardial infarction. What is the morphology of necrosis? Means, what is the microscopic examination of necrosis? This, the Under microscope, we see that areas of necrosis becomes glassy and homogeneous. It has a characteristic moth-eaten appearance. Again, there is increased eosinophilia or increased pink, pink stain or eosinophilia. Why it happens? Because there is loss of RNA and there is increased denatured proteins. And as we all know, these RNA and denatured protein, they take up this eosinophilic stains. So because of loss of RNA and increased denatured protein, there is increased eosinophilia and there is characteristic myelin figures. And these myelin figures are nothing but the phospholipid masses. So these are under microscopic examination. Under electron microscopy, if we see the plasma membrane will break. Now, if you remember, in case of reversible cell injury, the plasma membrane was forming blebs. But over here, the plasma membrane is breaking. And Within the mitochondria, there is amorphous densities, which is characteristic of necrosis. Okay. Now, at the level of the nucleus or nucleus ke level, mein kya ho hai? as I've already explained, pycnosis, the meaning of that is chromatin condensation, carrier hexis, the meaning of that is uh, nuclear fragmentation, and karyolysis, that means enzymatic degradation after which the nuclear disappears or there is dissolution. Now, let us 
look at the types of necrosis. Number one type is coagulative necrosis. So it is a type of necrosis as we see where the architecture is preserved. There is no proteolysis, means protein breakdown here is not happening. And localized area of coagulative necrosis is defined as an infarct. Localized area of coagulative necrosis is defined as an infarct. It occurs in solid organ, okay? Coagulative necrosis occurs in solid organs except brain. Brain may nahi hota hai coagulative necrosis. Except brain, it occurs in all solid organs. Example, liver, kidney. Now, second is your liquefactive necrosis. Liquefactive necrosis is a type of necrosis where proteolysis is present and the dead cells, because of proteolysis, converts into liquid form. Example, any kind of bacterial or fungal infection okay necrotic material itself forms what is called as pus so a liquid ne liquefied necrotic material gives rise to pus and as we have seen liquefactive necrosis is characteristically seen where in the brain so brain is the only solid organ which does not show coagulative necrosis but shows liquefactive necrosis another type being gangrenous necrosis let's see when gangrenous necrosis occurs so whenever there is a reduced blood supply to the limbs there it leads to coagulative necrosis and this when superimposed with super added bacterial infection leads to liquefactive necrosis in the form of wet gangrene so I repeat whenever there is a reduced blood supply to the limbs there it leads to coagulative necrosis followed by super added bacterial infection there will be liquefactive necrosis leading to wet gangrene Number four is caseous necrosis. Caseous necrosis, first of all, is nothing but it's a kind of necrosis characterized by cheese-like friable necrotic tissue piece. I repeat, a cheese-like friable necrotic tissue piece, an example being TB or granuloma. And there is fat necrosis. Now, fat necrosis kya hai? At any focal area of fat destruction, what happens or any uh, 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 place, whenever there is a pancreatic injury, of the pancreatic lipase is released and these lipase is acting on the triglycerides which breaks down the triglyceride to form fatty acids and this fatty acid combines with the calcium ions and forms a chalky white areas of fat destruction or fat necrosis and this is called as fat saponification so i repeat the pancreatic lipase enzyme is released from areas of pancreatic injury. These lipases are acting on the triglycerides, which causes the release of fatty acids. Now, this fatty acid combines with calcium to form chalky white areas of fat necrosis or fat destruction. And this process is called as fat saponification. Now, look at this diagram. Now, this diagram, as I am giving the arrow, it shows the morphological changes in a reversible cell injury and necrosis. It is the normal kidney tubules with a viable epithelial cell. So I repeat, there are the normal kidney tubules with viable epithelial cells. Okay. Now let's look at image number B. Image number B is showing reversible ischemic injury. It's showing surface blebs. The surface is showing different kinds of blebs. I will mark the blebs. Look at the blebs over here. Can you see the blebs? The surface is showing blebs. Surface is showing different kinds of blebs. There is increased eosinophilia. Can you see these cells are showing more amount of pink as compared to the adjacent cells? See these cells. They have become more pink. Look at these cells, they have become more pink. Isko bolte hai, increased eosinophilia of the cytoplasm and swelling of occasional cells. Okay, occasional cells are showing swelling. Let us look over here. And the third, the third diagram as we see, shows complete necrosis. Okay, I repeat, the third diagram, C, shows irreversible necrosis of the epithelial cell. As you see, the plasma cells have broken down. The plasma, cell the plasma cell membrane has been disrupted and there is injury of the epithelial cell with loss of the nucleus. Look over here. Do you find any nucleus inside this cell? There is no nucleus. There is fragmentation of these cells and there is leakage of cell contents. Look over here. There is a glassy homogeneous appearance. Okay, There is no nucleus, nothing. Now, look over here. 
this is an example of coagulative necrosis. Now, I give the example that any solid organ except the brain will show coagulative necrosis and any localized area of necrosis forms an infarct. So, here is an example of a wedge-shaped kidney infarct. This yellow area shows an area of infarct okay, in the kidney. If you look microscopically, very important is that uh, here we can see two parts. One part which is normal and another part which is showing coagulative necrosis. So, this part I am drawing, uh, this part is the normal part. Whereas, can you see over, the architecture is preserved. The architecture is preserved, but there is loss of nucleus. The cell architecture is preserved. There is no proteolysis. So, this part on the right side, I am giving a tick on the right side, is showing what? These are necrotic cells which are showing preserved cellular outlines, but there is loss of nucleus and inflammatory cell infiltrate is also there. Okay, so this is classically an example of coagulative necrosis. Now, over here, this is the brain. Brain is showing a type of necrosis which is characterized by proteolysis and that is forming liquefactive necrosis. An infarct in the brain showing dissolution of the tissue. Look, I am marking this area. This is the area which is showing liquefactive necrosis. Now, look at this area. Can you see a cheesy, friable area in the lung? This is an example of necrosis in the lung, tuberculosis of the lung with a large area of caseous necrosis containing yellow, white, cheesy debris. I repeat, this is the tuberculosis of the lung with a large area of caseous necrosis containing yellowish, white and cheesy debris. Now, as you remember, this is a, this is a diagram of a fat necrosis. Can you see this white, white? These are areas of chalky white depositions of fat necrosis in the pancreas. Okay, so the areas of white, chalky white deposits represents the foci of fat necrosis with calcium soap formation at sites of lipid breakdown in the mesentery. This is an example, as we will see, of fibrinoid necrosis. Look at this part, which is showing increased eosinophilia or increased pink stain. Now, this is an example of fibrinoid necrosis in an artery. Okay, The wall of the artery is showing a circumferential bright pink area of necrosis and inflammation. Okay, Bright pink area. This is an example of fibrinoid necrosis. So, fibrinoid necrosis kya hota hai? What is fibrinoid necrosis? Fibrinoid necrosis is a type of necrosis where antigen antibody complex deposits in the blood vessels. Okay, antigen antibody complexes deposits in the blood vessels and it is seen in rheumatic heart disease. Kaha dikta hai? In case of a rheumatic heart disease. And it is a condition where antigen antibody complex deposits in the blood vessels. And is a example kya hai? There are bright pink amorphous material okay it deposits as a bright pink amorphous material look at this image again bright pink amorphous material example of fibrinoid necrosis now we come to the mechanisms of cell injury Ki what are the basic mechanisms Ki cell kaise injury hota hai? how the cell injury takes place let us see as we see over here that whenever there is mitochondrial damage okay there is loss of ATP and there is increased free radicals okay or reactive oxygen species okay i repeat whenever there is mitochondrial damage there is a loss of atp and there is release of free radicals or reactive oxygen species now loss of atp causes multiple downstream effects let us see as i've already explained sodium potassium pump agar kharab ho jayega, if becomes bad there will be cellular swelling and cell burst Okay, there will be cellular swelling and cell burst. So, there is number one, cell swelling. Okay, number two, anaerobic glycolysis starts because there is no ATP, no oxidative phosphorylation. So, anaerobic glycolysis starts occurring. There is lactic acidosis. pH will fall. This leads to clumping of the nuclear chromatin. This leads to clumping of the nuclear chromatin. And third is, there is detachment of ribosomes from the endoplasmic reticulum. This leads to a, redu a reduction in the protein synthesis. But remember, where I reversible changes, tha, remember, all these cellular swelling, clumping of nuclear chromatin and decreased protein synthesis, all these things, three things are reversible 
if the injurious stimulus is revoked agar injurious stimulus is removed all these three things will be reversible okay but but if the injurious stimulus is persist i repeat if the injurious stimulus will persist the cell injury will will become irreversible and will lead to necrosis and will lead to necrosis whereas if you see the second part that free radicals they damage the proteins lipids and dna irreversibly leading to irreversible cell injury in the form of necrosis so as we see mitochondrial damage leading to decreased atp and increased free radical oxygen leads to necrosis leads to necrosis whereas what is the mechanism of apoptosis as we see apoptosis occurs whenever there is increased pro apoptotic proteins or decreased anti apoptotic proteins and whenever there is leakage of caspase it leads to cell death by apoptosis now <clears throat> another important question is the role of calcium in cell injury ki calcium ka kya role hota hai in cell injury remember reduced amount of calcium reduced amount of calcium in the cell is good okay reduced amount of calcium in the cell is a good thing calcium promotes apoptosis okay increased mitochondrial permeability cause karta hai increased calcium it activates multiple cellular enzymes and it is calcium is stored in the endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria i repeat decreased amount of calcium for the cell is a good thing okay calcium promotes apoptosis calcium kya karta hai apoptosis promote karta hai it also causes increased mitochondrial permeability if mitochondrial permeability will increase what will happen there will be loss of h plus ions which in, in turn will lead to decreased atp okay it activates multiple cellular enzymes and calcium is stored in the endoplasmic reticulum and in the mitochondria so if you see whenever there is cell injury cytosolic calcium increases now as we know it increases the mitochondrial permeability so there will be loss of h plus ions leading to decreased atp production and it stimulates multiple cellular enzymes as we see it stimulates phospholipases it stimulates proteases it stimulates endonucleases and atpase so when phospholipases are stimulated it acts on the phospholipids proteases acts on the cytoskeletal endonuclease causes dna damage and atpase cause reduction in atp so it leads to ultimate protein damage dna damage and loss of atp now important question is <clears throat> why mitochondrial damage will cause a fall in atp or reduced amount of atp answer is because of activation of high conductance channel usko bolte hain mptp channels or mitochondrial permeability transition pore which leads to loss of h plus ions and failure of oxidative phosphorylation ultimately leading to loss of atp production now this important topic is about membrane damage so how membrane damage occurs so whenever there is hypoxia or reduced amount of oxygen it leads to increased ros formation or reactive oxygen species formation and decreased in atp production so this leads to lipid peroxidation and reduced atp leads to phospholipid synthesis reduces as a result it leads to membrane damage another pathway is whenever there is membrane damage calcium will enter the cell it will stimulate multiple enzymes as we know phospholipids stimulate karega and it will stimulate proteases which again causes membrane damage so just see whenever there is membrane damage plasma membrane damage hoga plasma membrane damage <coughs> leads to loss of cell contents there can be lysosomal membrane damage which will lead to enzymatic digestion of cellular component and there will be mitochondrial membrane damage which leads to decreased atp production okay so all these all these things plasma membrane damage lysosomal membrane damage and mitochondrial membrane damage any kind of membrane damage will typically lead to an irreversible cell injury in the form of necrosis in the form of necrosis now let us see dna damage any kind of dna damage or any kind of misfolded protein so whenever there will be a dna damage or a misfolded protein the cell death will occur by apoptosis now let us look at the last topic of today that is free radicals what are the sources of free radicals oxidation reduction reactions in the body radiant energy in the form of uv rays and x rays inflammation from leukocytes fourth is 
enzymatic metabolism of exogenous chemicals or drugs for example ccl4 giving rise to this free radical transition metals also give rise to free radicals for example iron and copper this is a fenton's reaction where h2 to reacts with iron to form fe plus 3 and giving rise to the free radical hydroxyl ions and from nitric oxide uh, uh, it can give rise to a free radical known as peroxyl nitrate now all reactive all reactive oxygen species have a similar mechanism of cell damage they cause protein dna and lipid damage coming to the first reactive oxygen species this is known as superoxide ion the production of this kaise produce hota hai it is produced by incomplete reduction in leucocytes by phagocyte oxidase and degradation kaise hota hai with the help of the enzyme superoxide dismutase sod stands for superoxide dismutase into h2o2 and oxygen coming to the second free radical that is h2o2 or hydrogen peroxide how it is produced it is produced by action of superoxide dismutase on superoxide ion which converts it into h2o2 and oxygen and degradation kaise ho raha hai h2o2 in the presence of the enzyme catalase forms water and oxygen we have to remember if if degradation of h2o2 occurs in the peroxisome then the enzyme is catalase lekin agar h2o2 ka degradation is occurring in the cytosol or in the mitochondria then the enzyme is glutathione peroxidase so i repeat h2o2 in the presence of the enzyme catalase breaks down to form water and oxygen okay now if if the breakdown of h2o2 is occurring in the peroxisome the enzyme used is catalase and if it is occurring in the cytosol or the mitochondria the enzyme is glutathione peroxidase now let us look at the third hydroxyl ion production kaise ho raha hai again by fenton's reaction h2o2 in the presence of fe+2 forms fe+3 plus hydroxyl ions okay this is the fenton's reaction and number 2 h2o2 can undergo hydrolysis or because of radiation can itself break down to form hydroxyl ion now how there is degradation degradation kaise ho raha hai of hydroxyl ions hydroxyl ions in the presence of glutathione peroxidase gives rise to water one important mcq is hydroxyl ions are the most reactive ros or it is the principal ros okay the most reactive ros or the principal ros is the hydroxyl or oh ions the last free radical is peroxy nitrate that is onoo negative how it is produced with the help of superoxide ion it combines with nitric oxide to produce peroxy nitrate now peroxy nitrate kaise degrade hota hai with the help of peroxy redoxins it breaks into a weak acid that is nitrous acid now removal of free radicals now how free radicals are removed now as you already seen with the help of enzyme superoxide dismutase catalase peroxy redoxins glutathione peroxidase again uh, uh, with uh, the help of certain enzymes transferrin ferritin lactoferrin ceruloplasmin as we all know that iron and copper both of them help in the production of free radicals so if these are sequestered okay if these are sequestered with the help of transferrin ferritin lactoferrin or ceruloplasmin these are not allowed to participate in reactions leading to production of free radicals now antioxidants like vitamins a c and e glutathione green tea and kangen water all of these are antioxidants and superoxide ions spontaneously can also form o2 and h2o so these are the four mechanisms by which free radicals are removed now this is the last slide of the day this is the last slide of the day where we are going to compare between dry gangrene and wet gangrene a very common question which comes in our exam now according to the site dry gangrene occurs in the limb whereas wet gangrene kahan hota hai in the bowel look at the mechanism it dry gangrene is because of arterial occlusion whereas wet gangrene is because of venous occlusion more than arterial occlusion if you look at the macroscopic appearance dry gangrene me kya hoga the part is dry shrunken and black whereas wet gangrene the part is moist soft swollen dark and rotten in case of a putrif uh, agar putrefaction dekhenge it is limited in dry gangrene whereas it is marked in a case of wet gangrene line of demarcation is present in case of dry gangrene whereas there is no clear demarcation in wet gangrene if you look at bacteria 
they fail to survive in dry gangrene whereas the bacteria is numerous in case of wet gangrene and the prognosis is much better in case of a dry gangrene as compared to wet gangrene where the prognosis is poor thank you so much guys for uh, listening to me i will urge all of you to make a good note of all of these lectures and uh, thank you for uh, uh, subscribing to my videos and thank you for liking my videos keep watching my videos and stay tuned to my channel uh, here is dr jibran ahmed have a nice day thank you so much